And thank you, American Jewish Historical Society, for hosting us. So um, I got to know Trish Hall many lifetimes ago when we both worked at the Wall Street Journal. I was a reporter and Trish was an editor. Not always the best of friends, but in this case, I knew I wanted to be Trish's friend when I read a book she'd written called The New Connecticut Yankee. And it was actually the first two lines that completely won me over. The book began, steam rises from the sidewalks after a summer shower. Hartford smells like a laundromat. It took Trish a long time to get back to writing books, but in between she has had a most remarkable career. As an editor and writer at the Wall Street Journal, as a star lifestyle reporter at the New York Times, and then a transformational editor, she oversaw six sections of the newspaper and created the Sunday Review. She, she, for four years, she was the editor of the opinion pages at the New York Times. That experience led her to write, Writing to Persuade, How to Bring People Over to Your Side. It's a great book and beautiful too. Um, so Trish, right from the get-go, you had something that most writers struggle to find and that's a strong, clear voice. Yet you've spent much of your career as an editor, making other writers look good. Was this a preference or a coincidence? <laughs> I don't know, it might've been both and also just sort of practicality. Um, when I left college, I became a reporter at a small newspaper in Connecticut, and then I wanted to move to New Haven. And the only job I could get was as an editor. So. I went back and forth, which drives people crazy. They really like you to stick to one thing. And it was difficult to go back and forth because that's ground on. But um, I like both. I like editing my own work. I like editing other people's work. And, you know, people will tell you it's hard to be an editor and they, uh, it's, it's really much easier than writing. So sometimes after I'd be a reporter for a couple of years, I would just be exhausted and I'd want to just edit. It's much more fun. Fun for you. <laughs> now, um, well, I'm not a cruel editor. I'm just very blunt. No, it's true. In fact, I would say, and I'm not just saying this because you're here. Um, I would say it even if you want. You are probably my favorite editor because you are, I don't think blunt. I think direct and clear. You know, when you're editing something, you let you let the writer know what it is exactly doesn't work. And that's a huge help. Um, so, um, but let's talk about the editing part of your life first and then writing and editing and everything else. So most of, most of your career, uh, like mine, has been outside of political coverage. Uh, you covered business, food, lifestyle, real estate, for a time, you were the executive editor of Martha Stewart Living. Yet in 2011, you became the opinion editor at the New York Times, a job that's like, you know, mind boggling. You were on the masthead of the Times and really, I think, in the hot seat. Um, how did that come to pass and what was it like? I mean, it's funny because my original reporting life was I loved news. I didn't even know what a feature was really until I was went, until I went to the Wall Street Journal and they taught everyone how to write those page one features. Um, I went to Berkeley in the late 60s and early 70s. I covered riots. I loved news. I loved danger. I'm surprised I didn't become a war correspondent because I was very drawn to that. Um, but again, it's like people's careers are very serendipitous and most people don't want to think that. They want to think that they can control it and organize it. And maybe some people do, but I just sort of kept going to the, to the next thing. And when I was a reporter at the Wall Street Journal, I covered the food, tobacco and beverage businesses. I loved that combination because it meant I could go to wine tastings and I could smoke cigarettes, which I shouldn't have done. And I could eat good meals. I mean, it was a wonderful job. But when I wanted to get out of business reporting, because it's not really what I'm best at, and I went to the Times, you know, they, they have a food section, so they hired me as a food reporter. So I was a somewhat unusual food reporter, but that sort of moved me into the whole area of features and lifestyle, and, and I loved it because I was a history major. I always liked sociology and psychology and history, and I'm interested in 
people and how they behave, why they behave the way they do. And lifestyle was where I really got a chance to kind of play that out. Um, it's very odd that I became the op-ed editor. I, I love to gossip, as you know, and I'd heard that David Shipley, who was the op-ed editor, was leaving the Times to go to Bloomberg. And everybody else was very fixated on how much money he was going to make there because Bloomberg paid more. And I was like, wow, I wonder if I could get his job. Because at that point, I had um, I was on the masthead in the newsroom, and I didn't really edit anything anymore. I went to meetings, and I sort of managed people. And I missed really editing and really being involved with ideas. So I went to the opinion editor. His name was Andy Rosenthal, who was mostly focused on the editorials, but he was also the boss of the op-ed editor. And he said, you know, we're going to have to create this new weekly section. And that is something I really like to do because that's the form that features historically took when print was dominant. So I don't think I would have gotten the job if it hadn't involved the need to create a new section. It was very interesting for me because I don't really like to upset people and make them angry, which is one reason I wasn't the world's best business reporter. And I had to learn to deal with a lot of angry people. I had to I had to change and not just always be trying to please them. And did that feel good or did it feel bad? I mean, eventually it felt great. I mean, people would say, you know, well, this is relevant, I guess. Um, there were a lot of Jewish group, uh, there are a lot of Jewish groups that don't like the times. They feel like it is too sympathetic to the Palestinians. And, and, uh, and I was often being called upon by the publisher, maybe every six or eight months, to defend the coverage of Israel in the op-ed pages and to, you know, I always had to assure him that we had sort of given equal time to all sides. And at one point there was a big billboard outside of the Times, you know, hating the Times. And, you know, after a while, you just feel like you're doing your best. You think you're doing what's ethical and fair. And it was good for me. I, as long as you know that you're doing your best to be fair, you know, that's all you can do. So I stopped caring. So I just have to say one thing. My mother is watching this and I hope she's listening to this because she's one of those people who's always complaining about the Times' coverage and she loves you. So we'll see if you've made a convert there. I mean, I have, you know, lots of friends who find the Times very annoying on that, on that issue. And I don't think they're totally wrong. But what's complicated, as you know, from doing your last book, I don't think the Palestinians are totally wrong either. I mean, there's a way in which no one ever feels totally understood and heard. And so it's, it's difficult to give people that. Yeah, no, absolutely. So now we'll move from an easy subject, the Palestine, Palestinians in Israel to, to um, an even hotter subject, which is Donald Trump. So um, your tenure at op-ed ended in 2015, which was before the Trump era, which now seems like the distant past uh, <laughs> in some ways. Um, still, even, even before Trump and after Trump, um, op-ed, as you've alluded to, is just this crazy job because you're dealing with so many egos and personalities and interest groups. And, and yet you had this incredible power because even a president had to like mm -hmm. through the gatekeeper at the New York Times and movie stars who are used to getting every whim answered had to submit to your mercy. And so this is a two part question. So one, which is, I think everybody always wants to know and you address it in writing to persuade. Um, could you explain to people the process of how op-ed submissions are chosen at the times? Um, and is it possible for a president to get a thumbs down? And while you're answering that question, I guess it's three part little gossip. Who was the most who is the easiest powerful person to deal with and who was the hardest? So you can start with the process. That's probably yeah, the process was really interesting. I, I went to op-ed obviously as a person who had never been an op-ed editor. So I learned a lot from the people who were there who all happened to be like 40 years younger than I was. They were just fabulous. And they had a process which I continued of 
we had a, a group email, you'd probably use Slack now, but we had a group email. Um, and if somebody thought an op-ed was interesting, they would put it in there and see what everyone else thought. So we had a lot of communal discussion. And even though I made the final decision, I was very influenced by that because no one knows everything. I mean, I personally tended to edit a lot of you know science and health and um, business pieces and not a lot of foreign affairs because I've never been a foreign correspondent. So people had their own specialties. And so a lot of op-eds would go to those individual editors because people would figure out over time sort of who did what. But hundreds and hundreds a week, sometimes a thousand went to opinion at NY Times, which was the slush, which was just, and we had several news assistants whose job was to go through that every morning and see if there was anything interesting. And Sometimes they missed interesting things, which we would find out later because the person would find the name of an editor, but sometimes they found fabulous pieces. Um, so the, the bar is high and every editor is different. I mean, as you know, that kind of decision-making is completely subjective. There is no perfect op-ed. There is no op-ed that will work for every editor. And because of my background and what I'm interested in, I probably ran, I ran a lot of essays. I ran a lot of science and health. And I am very grateful that I was not the op-ed editor when Donald Trump was elected because everything became about Trump. I mean, there just was for quite a while, almost the entire time, nothing else. And that's not the only thing I'm interested in, but I can understand why that happened because it felt to people like that's all anybody was talking about. And it was like a national obsession. So. Fortunately, I got to do a big range of articles. Like one thing that came in in the slush was a former finance guy who now runs a nonprofit talking about how he was addicted to money and how that happened, what that meant. Um, I found that really interesting. Stuff like that didn't run during Trump. Um, so it's, now it feels like it's kind of getting back to normal, whatever normal is. It feels like there's a broader range of stories, like on every op-ed page, it wasn't just the Times. So the second part was celebrities. Um, unlike you, I've never covered celebrities. I have a weird, almost aversion to celebrities. And so, um, so I would often say to one of my deputies, if it was some celebrity, you can edit this, because I, I, don't, I don't really you know, care. Um, but I did happen to edit the second op-ed that Angelina Jolie wrote, not the first one. Um, and you never actually deal with a celebrity ever. You always deal with their person. So you can only judge them by their person, right? But she had a fabulous person. She didn't like PR firms. So she had a friend who was a politician in England and worked with human rights groups. I'm forgetting her name, but she was, the person you dealt with and she was very easy to talk to and she was funny and she was fun and it was very easy to edit her. Vladimir Putin, on the other hand, had, he had an excellent PR firm um, and they couldn't do anything without his approval. I think Angelina Jolie really deputized her person to just speak for her. They were friends, it was fine. Whereas with Putin, every little change I wanted to make had to go back to the PR person who went back to Putin and then they just said no to everything. So then I was like, is it worth running this? I guess so. I mean, there's much more focus by the public on op-eds now because of Twitter. There's much more intensity as everybody knows of sort of controversial op-eds. Um, I didn't have that experience. Maybe I was just lucky. Maybe it was a different time. I think now if somebody ran an op-ed from Putin, people might go nuts. I don't know. There, I mean, there was, some negative feedback, but um, probably would be more now. And well, just to follow up on that, whether it's Putin or anybody else, it, are the op-eds fact-checked the way a news article would be? I Wait, mean, news you know, articles, I mean, you know, the way newspapers work or websites, you hold the reporter responsible for the information. So uh, an editor will check certain things like spellings, but the reporter is responsible. Whereas op-eds are very odd. These are all outsiders and they don't, get paid, well, I get paid minimally, but you can't hold them responsible. So everything gets fact-checked, or it should. I mean, but I was very lucky. I had some very good fact-checkers and, and the individual editors would do a lot of fact-checking. 
And then do you push back? Like if Putin has a factual error and will they accept those changes? I mean, we pushed back on a lot of things and he accepted some and rejected a lot. And if he rejected anything that seemed absolutely critical and it would make the op-ed seem stupid, we would have rejected it. I mean, there are lots of op-eds that fell apart in the process of fact-checking. They turned out to be not quite true or the writer just wouldn't accept the change that we thought was really necessary. Yeah. So, there was a lot of conflict in the fact checking. I was really glad that I was not one of the fact checkers. Yeah, no, I can imagine, especially now that facts are so yeah. beautiful. <laughs> yeah. It's much harder now. I really feel for those people. Yeah, yeah. So as you alluded to before, we are the guests of the American Jewish Historical Society and um, the, the mission of this institution is, is interesting. I mean, it, it's a, an, an incredible archive. You know, you can go see Emma Lazarus's original notebooks, a little plug for the HAHS. It's kind of incredible. Um, and it's a great place for scholars and academics. But, um, you know, through, through different programs, it, I think part of the function is to help people think about Jewish culture and identity and history. And, um, I wanted you to talk about it, which you have a little bit already about um, another two-part question. I'm really into the two-part questions today. Um, but when you were working for opinion, you know, say outside the realm of, of Israel, um, uh, what other kinds of, you know, sort of, sort of how did Jew, Jewish culture not influence, but make you think about it in some ways, um, uh, professionally at the Times. Uh, you know, I know it's the New York Times, but it's also an international paper. And um, I don't know if, if there was, a, apart from issues of Israel, whether there were other ways of feeling the influence of Jewish culture at the, at the paper, which is owned by a family that at one point anyway was Jewish. Right, was Jewish. I mean, well, you, you know my history and I have this, um, my husband's Jewish, my daughter's Jewish. I am not, um, I've always had a lot of friends who are Jewish. So obviously there's some, there's some way I think there's a Jewish sensibility and a Jewish sense of humor that I like. And I remember, because I went from the Wall Street Journal to the Times, I don't think the Times is so much like this anymore, but at least when I went there in 86, I felt like the Wall Street Journal was a very American, really very Midwestern place. And even the Jews at the Wall Street Journal tended to come from the Midwest. I'm from a little town in Pennsylvania. I think I was very typical of a lot of the people there. And the editors were in charge and the reporters obeyed. And it was a very sane place, I would say. And the New York Times, when I went to the Times, the reporters are in charge, they're very, they push back, they're very aggressive. Is that Jewish culture or is that New York culture? Are they so intertwined in some way you can't tell the difference? I mean, I have so many close friends from the Times, so many wonderful people there. Um, and I do think that it's, it's life as a New York institution is sort of what created that personality within the Times. But some of it was there was certainly an era where there were a lot of very famous Jewish reporters there. Um, and so, you know, my husband says this somewhat insane thing. I think that, you know, New York is like, well, New York and Jews, they're like the same, like New York is this Jewish city. Well, of course not. It's a small percentage of people, but the influence of Jews on New York is so huge that I find it really hard you would probably find it easier to untangle what's what in terms of the history, but um, it was certainly a very different place. Yeah, I don't know. I, I am one of those Jews from the Midwest who was at the Wall Street Journal. And honestly, um, until I wrote the book about Wendy Wasserstein, I don't think I fully understood the New York Jewish experience um, because even if you're Jewish, if you're not from here, you're an outsider to a certain extent. Um, and so it's always interesting. I think about it with the American Jewish Historical Society. Is it American or is it New York? And that's a different, mm -hmm. it's definitely a different animal. And I think it's because probably <clears throat> Italian, 
Black, Chinese New Yorkers have Jewish have more in common than Jews right. from the Midwest might because it is it is and and maybe that's a different New York too. Certainly, you know, the next generation here is a little different also. They're they're they've right. lost some of that edge, I think. For better or for worse. So um since you left the Times a couple of years ago. You've been working as a consultant, um, helping people write op-eds, among other things. And I just wondered if you could talk about what it's like to be on the other side of the table, to be a supplicant rather than a decider. Um, and 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 in the course of telling us- Another two-part question. <laughs> another two-part question. I don't know if there are any one-part questions. Those are for people who can't answer the two-parters. Um, but the other, the other part of that is really, um, you know, what is it that, that people who haven't dealt with this experience before, what are their biggest misconceptions about both writing an op-ed and the submission process? Yeah, those are great questions. I mean, I like being on the other side. I'm not sure why I never would have thought that I would. It just kind of evolved. I mean, I sometimes edit books for people. I sometimes, I mean, I edit various things. Sometimes I write journalism, but mainly what I do is write and edit op-eds. And one of the biggest misconceptions is that people think if they're good and they're saying something true and good and obviously good, like we need to help poor people. We need to give more money. We need to give vaccine. I mean, all these things that you know that a liberal publication will endorse, that's not an op-ed. I mean, first of all, if the Times institutionally wants to say that, they'll just write an editorial. And the op-eds are supposed to be different from the editorials. I mean, every op-ed page is different, but the Times form, the Times started it 50 years ago and a lot of people now have the same system. So um, even if they don't have an institutional editorial voice, they're trying to add to the conversation. They're trying to say something different. And that's what I think people don't get. Like just because they're saying something interesting and good, I mean, that's not really enough. I mean, you have to be saying something that hasn't been said. You have to have a different perspective on some conversation that's kind of going on. And you have to do it very quickly because everybody else is thinking the same thing. And then the other biggest problem is academics, business people, the kind of people that I write op-eds for they really get lost in their jargon. And they think that if they don't use their jargon, they're not being serious. And they don't even know they're using jargon. So they just have all these words <laughs> that sound like robots did it. And, um, and so I think sometimes they think my language is too simple. Um, but if they read op-ed pages, which is another mistake people read, they have to read whatever publication they're trying to get into. They're, they're meant to be accessible to the general reader. It cannot presuppose any scientific or financial or whatever understanding. You have to explain things. Um, so I think people don't really understand the need to be original, fast, conversational, whatever. And they also think that if you hire someone who knows someone, it'll just go in. And of course, that's not how it works. Um, I don't get involved with trying to place it. I tell everyone, just email it yourself. Um, it, unless you're coming from like the editor's very best friend, nothing really has a leg up because of who it came from. I mean, when I was in op-ed, we rejected a lot of celebrities who said they made all of those mistakes. They made very obvious points about, yeah, like who's going to say, no, we don't really want to end poverty. Like, you know, they would write about things that they cared about, which of course you admire, but they wouldn't do it in some way that was different. And if it's not different, like if somebody doesn't finish that op-ed and say, ah, I never thought of that, then it's probably not a successful piece. So would, would you reject a piece by the president of the United States? If well, when I went there and I was trained by all these young editors who I loved, and I took in all of their biases because the editor had left and he took a lot of the staff with him. So I was really unstaffed. Um, they said, 
their point of view, and it seemed really smart to me, they said it was sort of the history of op-ed was that if someone already has a platform, you have to have an extra justification for running them. They can already get reporters to listen to them. They already have you know, a lot of followers on Twitter or whatever. So um, I, don't, I, I don't think we ran a political figure even once a year, maybe at the most once a year. Um, we had sort of a bias against people who were already famous um, or who already had access to the media. I mean, countervail, like people don't care that much about an op-ed from the president, right? Unless he's announcing something major. They do like celebrities and you can't ignore the fact that your readers are curious to hear what Angelina Jolie has to say. So if somebody else had written that exact same thing, would it have run? No, I mean, it, it was interesting because of who she was. So, but yeah, the tendency is to reject famous people. Yeah, that's so interesting. I mean, I think a lot, uh, so much of it is counterintuitive or what, or maybe counter suspicious, you know, that people just have these assumptions about what makes things, how things run. And I mean, I always feel people always think people have this great master plan. And I think most people are just like us bumbling around and finding your career because it pops up in front of you. Um, exactly. And that's how, that's how publications go. When I talk to people, who are trying to place op-eds. I'm like, editors are really busy. They're really tired. They're really underpaid. They're overwhelmed by email. Your first sentence has to be great. Your second sentence as well. Don't bury your point, you know, five paragraphs down and make life easy for them. Some of the writers we worked with over and over again, like we do awful things to them. We'd hold their stories for three months and then think, oh, this is timely, let's run it tomorrow. Let's back check it right now. And we call the writer and say, we need you to drop everything you're doing right now. And, and that's terrible, but that's what we did. And the people who would say, oh, sure, that's fine. We worked with them again. Um, so it's kind of not fair. It's definitely not fair, but the editor has the power in that situation. And the writer has the power to just take the op-ed away. But it's a very strange relationship. It's different editors and reporters who are working for the same institution. We weren't working for the same institution as our writers. Yeah, no, I, I think, yeah, it's really interesting. So now I'm gonna give another plug for writing to persuade because it leads into my next question. I love this book, um, by the way. So um, it, it's beautifully, it's everything Trisha says. It's beautifully written, it's surprising, it's direct. Um, so I'm just gonna read a couple of sentences that are also little writing instructions for all of those of you who wanna write op-eds for the New York Times or anywhere else. If something sounds like it can't possibly be true, be suspicious, aggressively question facts you agree with, not the ones that go against your bias. So you have an entire chapter called the power of empathy, not something people necessarily would associate with an editor from the New York Times, the power of empathy. Um, and it doesn't sound very argumentative. So how would you describe your philosophy about persuasive writing and thinking? Well, it's funny, when I was there, I didn't really have a philosophy. I was just trying to like do the job. But when I left um, and I started working on that book, I, I did the obvious thing. I'm a reporter, I like to learn new things. I looked at all the research I could find on persuasion. And in a lot of ways, it just confirmed my instincts and my experiences, which is that you don't win people over by yelling at them. You don't win people over by having arguments with them, that you have to really truly understand where they're coming from. Like I was in a, a store the other day on Long Island and this woman was really nice and she's an artist and she has interesting stuff. And I'd never met her before and we started talking and then I think a lot of people are really enjoying talking to customers now because they couldn't for a long time, right? And it, it came around to the fact that she would not take the vaccine. And I thought, wow, this is interesting, but I, I didn't, if I go in again, I might talk about it. All I said was, no, you know, people have different feelings about the vaccine. It's new, I get it. And I think, and I felt that way. I wasn't like faking because then I was gonna come in with the blow. I mean. You can't 
pretend that you understand how other people feel. You really have to think like a young, healthy woman might not want to put this foreign thing in her body. She just might not, you know? And just because I do, because I'm older and I'm in a different risk group. And I think that applies to conversation and it applies to writing. Like the, I was always looking for more conservatives because we did not get enough of them at the times. And the conservatives who wrote well, who, who reached our readers and you know, were, their pieces were popular, they would find some way of establishing common ground with liberals because they sort of rightly assumed that a lot of the readers were maybe centrist, maybe liberal, but probably not conservative. And I think finding that common ground, that's part of empathy. Maybe it's a corollary or something, but we have common ground with everyone if we try to find it. And in your writing, you can think about how what you're saying would strike the likely audience and, and take that into account in how you're writing. Is that too vague because- No, no, it's not, but I'm gonna make you make it more specific in a minute because I'm gonna edit you on this one. No, I think it's great, but it's also, you, you it's funny your encounter with the person in the store um, it, it leads to a question I was gonna ask um, in a minute or so, but I'm gonna ask now, which is about the vaccine and about, you know, I read someplace that 25 to 30% of people say they just won't get it. And so the question is, how, how do you, pers how do you, what, what would be your method of trying to persuade that person? Like, what would you do? I mean, it's a really interesting thing, right? And when, and I am pretty obsessed with the vaccine coverage and read a lot of academic articles on it. And so in the beginning, 40% um, of the people in the US said they probably wouldn't take the vaccine. And the, the percentage of people who say they won't take it has been dropping. And the theory is that as they see, this is why the Johnson & Johnson thing is sort of a big setback, but as they see people getting it and then sort of having lives again and being okay, then their nervousness, there's less nervousness. Um, I think um, it's a little bit, something is, it's a little bit like when so many people stop smoking. Some of it is social pressure. Like what do people in your group do? You're much more likely to be convinced of something by someone in your group. So I wasn't actually friends with this woman, but if one of her friends was getting it, that would have much more influence than a stranger. So there's sort of like, there's your friend group. I mean, I love smoking, but I, it reached the point where Socially, people weren't doing it. It just became a thing that people were starting to look down on. It was really, the, the social pressure is really important. Facts are important, but they're not the main thing that convinced people. You know, people really react to um, people they admire and to their friends. So somebody wrote somewhere, probably on Twitter where I spend too much time, that if only Donald Trump had not gotten his vaccine in secret, if he had gotten it, publicly, that would have really helped. So thinking about what celebrities, what, what people might influence these hesitant people, but that's a hard one because they're not all Republicans, they're not all Democrats. There, is, there does seem to be though, the biggest percentage of them does seem to be white Republicans. So I would try to figure out, you know, what celebrity they liked, who, who, who might they respond to? Because you can't go around one by one and talk to their friends, you know, but so you have to get sort of a proxy for that friendship. Yeah, no, it's really interesting. And I mean, I think about that a lot, you know, because even when you're a reporter, you're constantly persuading people to talk to you and you're trying to find common ground with people who you might feel not that much in common with. So your your job though is to get people to express it that way which is which is so interesting which sort of makes me think of something else which is the quality of writing in general i mean what did you see in general i mean i know a lot of things that people submit to op-eds have been through a lot of maybe professional helpers or whatever but um do you think that with um the easy access of writing now you know everybody's typing all the time or 
gum typing all the time or whatever it is we do, do you think writing has become better or worse? I mean, that's interesting. I just, I don't know because I don't, um, I was thinking about that for myself. I was thinking if I still had to write by typing, would I think first and then type? Because I don't feel like I think first. I feel like I figure out what I think by typing and I have all these words and then it's like, oh, that's the through line. That's the, so I, I don't know if I, I, we've had computers now for so long, at least journalists have, um, that I, I suspect that writing would be different if we didn't all have this access. But I mean, I'm really glad everyone has access. I just wish they would trust themselves more. Like some of my favorite op-eds were from teenagers or they're just from people who had something to say. Like people need to trust that they that their experience, not to write about something that they have nothing to do with, but to write out of their own experience. Like a high school student writing about what it's like to do remote schooling during the pandemic is interesting. It wouldn't be interesting if that kid wrote about, you know, how to solve the problems in Syria. You know, so I think people need to understand that everybody has something to say if they'll let themselves say it. That's another thing I've really noticed with sort of especially corporate people. They do not want to say anything that could get them in trouble with anyone. And I understand why it's their business. There's reasons for that. I think there's a an obvious trend toward people being afraid to say what they think because it's so polarized and between the left and the right, they're, they're gonna just get you know crushed. But um, I wish that weren't the case and I just wish everyone would try to get in touch with what they think and say it. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. Um, I mean, it is amazing when you get a powerful person who actually just says something um, that seems honest, it's sort of like, wow, <laughs> that's right. shocking or interesting. Um, so, you know, I just remembered we're getting almost to the words, the end of this, and it's at lunch with, and I haven't even asked you what you're going to have for lunch, which is ex especially important. You're a foodie. Well, it's still raining. Um, so I'm probably, well, you and I had hoped to have lunch together, but it seems like a bad idea because then you have to choose a restaurant that has a really good outdoor cover and that's too complicated. So I live right around the corner from Pan Quotidian and I'll probably go get what sounds really boring to people, which is a salad with chicken. Um, but they have really good food and they're right there. They're not far in the rain. What are you having? Um, I don't know. I'm sort of torn between a peanut butter sandwich, which just <laughs> It on a rainy day and maybe some soup <laughs> also boring um so you know i just realized when you were talking about the high school kid um writing about homeschooling that we have not even talked about the pandemic uh at all and um as you alluded to earlier, you are an obsessive researcher. When I have wanted to know anything about, are the rates up in New York? Are they down? What should I do? Can I, can I go shopping? Uh, I always call you. Um, so has that obsessive research quality made this past year easier or harder, do you think? Well, you know, I have a friend on Long Island who has a little bookstore and she asks her friends for books to suggest and she'll stock them. And it's a fun way to stock a bookstore, right? She knows a lot of people who read a lot. And she asked me again recently, I was horrified because I feel like, yes, I've read books this year, but I don't think I read nearly as many books as I would have normally because I was always reading about COVID. And um, I just find it fascinating. Like right now in New York, things are kind of, not going down as fast as it seems that they would, given that, you know, vaccination is rolling along. Um, so the sort of disparities around the country, like why places like Mississippi, where no one wears a mask and no one does anything that we all think you should be doing in New York, why they're in a different situation. <clears throat> it's kind of fascinating. I don't know what the long-term, I don't know if there'll be political repercussions. I don't know if it will change the way people think about the economy or work or anything. But as you know, I was the real estate editor once, so I am 
really interested in what happens to all the commercial real estate in New York if we all keep working at home. Um, But yes, so I have read way too many articles and uh, not enough books. I'm trying to return to books. I'm trying to lessen my COVID um, research. And um, I'm, you know, actually reading a science book now. I've got to, I've got to get away from, from the news. And so um, we just have a couple of minutes left. Um, I can't believe how, oh, I can believe that this went by extremely quickly as our conversations often do for me. Um, but um, uh, what, what's up for you? What is, um, Oh, wait a second before, you know what? Somebody did ask a question from the audience why there are no moderate voices at the Times. I mean, there's columnists and there's outsiders, right? So I would say one of the columnists who really represents moderation is Frank Rooney. And unfortunately he's leaving to go be a professor, but he'll write, he's going to Duke. He will write once in a while. He'll write like once a month. I think of Bruni as a moderate. Maybe somebody else would think of him as not. Um, I think it's really complicated because there is some, I think there's some way where people associate moderation with something that's boring. So there are columnists there and there are op-eds that sort of represent a moderate, a sort of centrist point of view. But um, actually not as many as I would like to see. And it's harder to make them more exciting. Like, it's just a quickie aside. I did a lot of research, like a lot of research once on a book about genetically modified foods. And then I realized I could not do the book because I was not wholly for them or wholly against them. And I think that affects all of media. Fascinating. Um, and now that brought another question. What percentage of op-eds are solicited? Oh, that's a really good question. I forgot about that. Because we had all these different editors with sort of subject area expertise, if there was something in the news and we couldn't just count on someone to send something in, well, you know, like a, you know, a, hur- a hur- devastating hurricane somewhere, um, we would quickly Google, you know, do research, find someone who might be good to write on that topic. So definitely there were a fair percentage that were solicited, but it would depend on the news. I don't know what percentage that was, but in a typical day, maybe, I mean, but it's changed. I'm not there anymore. Maybe one of one of five might've been solicited, two or five. Uh-huh. And then somebody now at the end, everybody's coming up with their questions. You should have put those in earlier, but somebody asked a great question. They were watching the, the uh, show about Hemingway and love seeing all the handwritten notes in the margin. And do you think that's lost with writing on a computer where it's so easy to backspace and delete when you know you don't have the trail? Of the yeah, it's totally, it's totally lost. I mean, you know, you have all, Google Docs saves all your versions, but no one's ever going to look at them. Um, I mean, it's lost in reading too. I still like reading books on paper because if I I don't like the idea of marking up digital books. I find it more complex than it's at a worth. But um, yeah, there's there's certain things that are lost to history. I mean, those versions do exist, but it'll be much more arduous for historians to go through them. Yeah, no, I've thought about this too, you know, especially here we are at the American Jewish Historical Society, which is filled with archival material, letters, diaries, all that great stuff. And I wonder, it'll have to be a very small building in the future. You realize that even in your own life, like pictures you take of people, your friends, your kids, you know, now that we have them on our phone, we're much less likely to print them out. So if you looked at the pictures in my house, you know, it looks like time stopped, you know, 17 years ago or whenever we started taking them this way. And it's weird. Yeah, no, I agree with that. So now I'm going to ask you, because we really are at that time, what, what, what's your plan? Are you, you planning on staying and do you want to write a sequel to writing to persuade or what is your thought on your next, your next move? 
I mean, you have a great business, so that may be your next move. I mean, I wish I had plans. Um, one thing I've wanted to do since I was, you know, six or something is write a novel. And unlike you, I've never managed to do it. Um, so that's what I'm trying to do. And it's terrible most of the time. Now I'm reading books on how to write a novel. I think it's hysterical that I have done nothing in my life but read fiction. I love fiction. And now I have to read a book on how to write a novel because I read them for pleasure. I never really paid enough attention to the structure. So I'm trying to teach myself to write a novel and I doubt very much whatever I write would ever get published, but it's like a great process. I'm, I like doing it. That's great. Well, write that novel. I'd be thrilled to read it. I'm sure it'll be, it would be great. Um, I actually find that this book is a little bit, not like a novel so much as a memoir, because it does have a lot of information about your backstory. But um, I, I, think, I think the hardest part of writing a book anyway is just that miserable first draft. And I think the hardest thing is just to do it. Right. Do it. Very good advice. <laughs> Trish, this has just been wonderful. Thank you so much for having lunch with me, sort of, at a distance. <laughs> well, we had lunch the way we always do. We just talked our way through it. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. It was great. Okay, thank you.